Local authorities essential to ensure that the services provided for all Americans can be continued over the coming months. I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Mississippi. Madam President, this continuing resolution results from an agreement reached between the President and the Congressional leadership for a six-month clean CR that adheres to the fiscal year 2013 spending levels set out in the Budget Control Act. The continuing resolution does not make reductions in programs for which the President requested less money in fiscal 13, nor does it make cuts that have been proposed by the Congress. Neither does a resolution increase funding for programs that Congress or the administration deem to be high priorities, with a few exceptions. The continuing resolution does not contain any new oversight provisions to guide agencies, nor does it include any new riders to limit the activities of the executive branch. In short, it puts the portion of government that we call discretionary on automatic pilot. The enactment of this resolution will, for the time being, avoid a disruptive government shutdown fight. The resolution represents a lost opportunity. We've lost the opportunity to provide agencies with at least some certainty about funding for this fiscal year. We've lost the opportunity to make informed judgments about which programs are effective and deserving of additional resources and which programs should be reformed or terminated. Contracts will not be led in a timely and efficient manner, and acquisition and construction costs will rise with delay. The morale of the federal work service, workforce will suffer. Perhaps most importantly, we have lost a chance to supplant the looming sequester. Elections have consequences, Madam President, as they most certainly should, but elections should not have the consequence of rendering Congress unwilling or incapable of performing its most fundamental duties in the times leading up to those elections. In my view, the thoughtful and dutiful appropriation of funds for our national defense and other government operations is such a fundamental duty. I deeply regret that the majority leader chose not to call up a single appropriations bill. Chairman Inouye has shown impressive leadership of our committee in reporting 11 of the 12 bills out of our committee. Most were reported on a broad bipartisan basis. The chairman and ranking members of the subcommittees have put a lot of time and thought into the bills. The staffs have worked very hard producing this legislation. The other body has also produced a bill. It has passed seven of the appropriations bills in the other body, and I suspect would have passed the others had there been any sign of movement in the Senate. We can only speculate as to why none of the bills have been considered here in the Senate. Other issues were deemed more pressing or expedient for one reason or another. Perhaps votes on amendments to spending bills were deemed to be politically perilous, whatever the reasons. I ask unanimous consent, Madam Chairman, Madam President, that the balance of my remarks be printed in the record. Without objection. Madam President. The Senator from Hawaii. I believe the record should show how much we appreciate the work of the distinguished senator from Mississippi, the vice chairman of the committee, Zach Cochran. We have demonstrated to our colleagues that bipartisanship works in this Senate. All they have to do is watch us operate. Yield the floor. The Senator from Wisconsin. Madam President, I rise today with great sadness to inform the Senate that Jennifer Green, a valued member of my staff and a cherished member of the Senate family, passed away last weekend after a brief illness. It is a comfort to all who knew Jennifer that she spent her last hours 
in a room filled with the family she cherished so deeply, but no room on earth would have been large enough to hold, to hold all those who mourn her, who have been touched and made better by Jennifer's beautiful smile, big heart, and easy friendship. She is sorely missed in my office, throughout the Senate, and even across the country. Jennifer worked in my office for the past 14 years, but she served the Senate for nearly a quarter century, starting with the Sergeant of Arms when she was just 20 years old. Jennifer was often the first face visitors to my office would see. She did more than just arrange capital tours or point them to the nearest DC attraction. She worked out a botched hotel reservation, found a glass of water to soothe an overheated toddler, listened to worries about a failing farm, a sick grandparent, or a threatened job. Many of my constituents arrive in the office a little overwhelmed by Washington, perhaps a little angry at Congress. But after meeting Jennifer, they left knowing they had a friend here. Jennifer put a human, caring face on the Senate, a service to this institution that affected the way hundreds and probably thousands of Wisconsinites viewed their government. Of course, no one, not visitor or staff, could leave the office without an update on Jennifer's family, especially her beloved mother, Beatrice Spicer, her father, Floyd Spicer, her brothers and sisters, and her son, Lorenzo Green. She was so proud of this fine young man, as we all are. Though Jennifer, through Jennifer, we got to watch a mischievous little boy grow to a talented and strong man serving our country as a member of the U.S. Coast Guard. She made sure everyone got a good look at the handsome and big frame picture she kept in her cubicle of Lorenzo in uniform. Jennifer made us all feel like we were part of her wonderful family. She was always the first to ask to see the picture of a new baby, quick to drive a colleague to the doctor or listen to a staffer who lost a parent, ready to swap a recipe or dissect the Redskins' latest performance. And that wasn't just my experience and that of my staff. Jennifer knew just about everyone who works on the Hill. We've had a steady stream of visitors stopping by the office to share memories and express their condolences. Thank you all for the comfort that has brought our staff. Jennifer's funeral will be held in her hometown of Princeton, West Virginia this Saturday. I urge anyone who wants to attend or to leave a message for the family through the funeral home to contact my office for details. We will also be organizing a memorial service for Jennifer here in the Senate in the coming weeks, and we will make sure all offices get plenty of notice so that her many friends can be there. Everywhere you look in the Capitol, there are plaques, pictures, and statues commemorating the men and women who built this great institution. But these, like all things physical, oftentimes fade or are forgotten. Jennifer touched the heart of the Senate, the people who work here, and the people who visit. Hers is a legacy and a contribution that time cannot erase. For everyone in my office and for the entire Senate, I offer my deepest condolences to Jennifer's dear family. I hope you can find comfort in knowing of all the good she did and the joy she brought in her time here. We will all miss her profoundly and hold her in our hearts forever. I ask unanimous consent to insert a copy of Jennifer's obituary in the record, and I yield the floor. Without objection. Madam President. The Senator from Utah. Madam President, I rise today to recognize and honor my friend Ryan McCoy, a departing member of my staff. Ryan McCoy is, in fact, much more than just a member of my staff. He's been the energy behind many of my legislative goals, and he's also a close friend. While no tribute of words could ever match the debt of gratitude that he truly deserves, I'd like to pay tribute in the official records of Congress to someone who fought to make a difference, both for the state of Utah and for our country. C.S. Lewis said that friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. My friendship with Ryan McCoy, my former legislative director, was born in that very way described by C.S. Lewis. We met back in 2009 when I was speaking to a group of Utahns about 
a topic near and dear to my heart, Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. I spoke of my passion for the Constitution and for the principles of limited government embodied therein. And my message apparently struck something of a chord with Ryan, who had recently taken a greater interest in finding ways to restore those same principles. We spent several hours after the speech talking about what the Constitution meant to both of us. I had not always thought about running for office, but when Ryan suddenly prepared a PowerPoint presentation for me about the problems that we face as a country and about the ways in which he and I working together could make a difference, I started thinking much more seriously about it. When Ryan and I discussed later his leadership role in my office, his wife, Kara, jokingly told him that he had no idea what he was doing. But the truth is that we needed to know only one thing, just one thing, that, that we could make a difference. In the end, I believe that was our greatest asset. Ryan and I shared a vision for change in Washington. We knew it would not come easily, but it had to come from people who wanted to make a difference. It had to come from people who had lived in difficult economic circumstances and felt the need for change as it tugged at their own pocketbooks and at their own individual freedoms, being eroded by an ever-expanding government. At a meeting a few months after we met, Ryan spoke of the common goals we shared. He said that our movement would be based on a clear, unequivocal message that it was time to change course for our country. Ryan and I shared this vision, and Ryan knew that others would catch on to it. In nearly two years, while he served as my legislative director, he worked hard, he worked tirelessly, he worked constantly to keep us focused on these legislative goals and to keep us true to our principles. It's safe to say that I would not be here today without the hard work and dedication of Ryan McCoy. Once here, I would never have been able to do many of the things that I have done without Ryan McCoy's expert assistance. Ryan will be remembered in my office as a respected leader and as a man who truly loves his country. Too often in the hustle and bustle of Washington, we tend to take our staff members for granted. It's when they leave that we truly see the impact that they've had and the wide breadth of the influence they had while they were here. And as much as we will miss Ryan, we will also miss his wife, Kara, and her shared enthusiasm every bit as much. I thank Kara. He and, uh, she and Ryan have become an important part of my life, an important part of my family, an important part of my office family. In addition to thanking Kara, I also want to thank Ryan and Kara's children, Connor, Tate, Gage, and McCall, for loaning their dad to me for these few years. Kara once told me that during a particularly busy time in the Senate, one of their children, I don't remember which one, actually came to her and asked her where their dad had gone and whether or when he might be returning. I appreciate their sacrifice, and I hope that they will grow up knowing that their father is a true hero of mine and always will be, one who works tirelessly for his country and for their future. I wish them the best back in Utah, and on behalf of myself, Sharon, and my entire staff, I extend my love and sincere appreciation to each of them. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President. The Senator from Minnesota. Thank you, Madam President. Two enormous challenges will await us when we return from recess. Our economy is still not yet fully recovered from a devastating recession and the prospects for our middle class and for those aspiring to be in the middle class or to get back into the middle class remain uncertain. Meanwhile, our budget remains sorely out of balance and our long-term debt crisis is putting our nation's fiscal future at risk. These two challenges are, of course, linked. We can't hope to solve our long-term debt problem unless we get our economy growing again, and we can't hope to rebuild our prosperity unless we resolve our budget problems. 
So we will have big decisions to make when we come back. But in the meantime, the American people will be wrestling with the same issues. What should we do to grow our economy and reduce our debt? What are the right investments to make? How should we pay for them? What sacrifices must be made in the name of fiscal responsibility? And who's going to make them? That's, that's the debate our nation will have over the next six weeks. Those are the questions we must be prepared to answer when we return. So before I go home to Minnesota to share my thoughts with my constituents, I wanted to take a few moments to share, share them with my colleagues. My view of what we should do in response to these challenges is based upon what we have done in response to similar challenges in the past. We are not the first Congress or the first generation to struggle with these issues. At the end of 2011, our national debt had reached 100% of our gross domestic product. That, that is frightening. But after World War II, our debt was 121% of GDP. Now, to be fair, we had something to show for it. We had won World War II, and the world was a very different place in 1945 than it is today. But the point is, is that we were tested. And how did we respond? Well, we invested in things that we believed would grow the economy. We invested in education, things like the GI Bill, which helped my mother-in-law, widowed at age 29, go to college, and in Pell Grants, which helped my wife Franny and her three sisters go to college. We invested in infrastructure. We, built 40,000 miles of highways in the 1950s. We invested in innovation, and we won the space race, which in turn led to the creation of whole new, whole new industries, like personal computers and, and telecommunications. Those investments paid off, and our economy experienced three decades of incredible growth, growth that flowed to the top, to the middle, and to the bottom. Between 1947 and 1977, wages for the top fifth, the top fifth of workers grew by 99 percent. And wages for those on the in the bottom fifth, they rose by 116 percent. I know that's hard to believe. The wages of the bottom fifth grew more than those of the top fifth. But really, that happened. And even though we remained a nation in which many kids, like my wife Franny, grew up in poverty, we had enough to invest in a strong safety net that helped those kids, like Franny and her sisters and her brother, work their way into the middle class. We bounced back from World War II to build an economy with a middle class that was strong, secure, and accessible to almost everyone. And thanks in large part to the growth generated by that thriving middle class, we were able to lower our national debt to about 31% by 1981. So 121% at the end of World War II 1981 to about 31%. Since then, our economy has had some good times and some bad times. We've raised taxes and we have lowered taxes. We've had surpluses and we've had deficits. And as this chart shows, our debt relative to GDP has gone up and down. We've seen the results of a variety 
of approaches to the issues that we face today. Now, in the 1980 election, Ronald Reagan was elected on a platform that appealed to concerns that the government taxed too much and spent too much, and his approach was later called starving the beast. Here's how, here's how he explained it. Now, this is a quote. This is, this is Reagan, uh, President Reagan. There are always those who told us that taxes couldn't be cut until spending was reduced. Well, you know, we can lecture our children about extravagance until we run out of voice and breath. Or we can cure their extravagance by simply reducing their allowance, cutting taxes, cutting revenue to the government. When Reagan took office, he fulfilled his campaign promise and signed into law a huge tax cut. And on cue, we began to amass enormous deficits, almost immediately. In fact, President Reagan's budget director at the time, David Stockman, has explained that 1981 was when the era of large permanent deficits began. The deficits were so bad in his first year, in 1981, that President Reagan had to increase taxes in 1982. And again, in 1983, in fact, he ended up raising taxes 11 times, not because Ronald Reagan was a socialist. I, I, don't, I, I really don't think so. But rather because he couldn't ignore the arithmetic. Still, that first tax cut was so big that over the course of his presidency, over the course of his presidency, our national debt nearly tripled. It continued to grow rapidly during the administration of George H.W. Bush, and then he handed it off to President Clinton. And what he handed off was, at that point, the largest deficit in the history of our country. In President Clinton's 1993 deficit reduction package, he added two new tax rates, marginal tax rates at the top end, 36% for income above $180,000, 39.6% for income above $250,000. Republicans objected rather vehemently, arguing that asking the top 2% to pay a little more would send the economy into a recession, which of course would be detrimental to the goal of reducing the deficit. The bill passed without a single Republican vote in either house. But the Republicans' dire predictions turned out to be wrong, extremely wrong. Between 1993 and 2001, this country experienced an unprecedented expansion of our economy. We created 22.7 million net new jobs. We decreased the number of Americans in poverty to record lows. We increased the median household incomes, and we created more millionaires than we ever had before. And not only did President Clinton's deficit reduction plan reduce the deficit, it eliminated the deficit. President Clinton was able to hand off to President George W. Bush a record surplus. And in fact, in January of 2001, we were on track to completely pay off our national debt by the year 2011. However, as we know, President Bush chose a different course. Now, whether or not you agree with the two wars we entered into during his administration, the new entitlement program that we created, or the 
to tax cuts we passed. The fact of the matter is that we didn't pay for any of those things. They all went on our national credit card. And while the two tax cuts tilted toward those at the top did help some at the top do extremely well during the Bush administration, it's hard to say that the stuff we put on that credit card created the kind of durable, broad-based prosperity we saw in the 1990s or that we built in the 30 years after World War II, for that matter. It would be hard to say because when President Obama took office from President Bush, the economy was hemorrhaging jobs at the rate of over 800,000 a month. And when the bill came for the Bush policies, we were staring at a projected $1.1 trillion deficit for 2009. That was the projected deficit that President Bush left for President Obama. So far I've talked about President Reagan and his approach of cutting revenue in order to force the government to cut spending. We saw what happened. We couldn't or didn't cut enough spending to keep our budget in balance. And we had huge deficits even when Reagan tried to backtrack and raise more revenue. I've talked about President Clinton and his approach of raising taxes on the top 2% in order to bring the budget into balance. And we saw what happened. The economy grew. And we generated a record surplus. I've talked about President Bush and his approach of cutting taxes and incurring large expenses without worrying about the ramifications on the deficit. And we saw what happened. Deficits ballooned. And when the economy crashed, it crashed hard. So what about President Obama? What has his approach been? Well, if you ask some people, including unfortunately many in this chamber, they tell you that President Obama's approach was to go on a massive spending spree. Well, it's just not true. Over his four budget years, federal spending is on track to rise from $3.52 trillion to $3.58 trillion, an annual increase of 0.4%. Now, you can hash these figures out in different ways, but here's a chart that comes from Market Watch, a publication of Dow Jones, which also owns the Wall Street Journal. And that is Obama's increase in spending from 2010-13. This is Reagan from 2008 to 85. It uses, these are numbers from the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office and from the Office of Management and Budget. And you can see that the growth of federal spending is lower than it was under any of the presidents that I talked about. Indeed, the article that ran with this chart concludes that the growth of federal spending under President Obama is the lowest it's been since the Eisenhower administration during the wind down from the Korean War. But remember that besides a $1.1 trillion deficit, President Obama inherited an economy that in the month he took office lost over eight hundred thousand jobs. That was January. The next month, February 2009, we lost about 700,000 jobs. But that's also the month in which we passed the Recovery Act. By the way, when the Recovery Act was passed in February of 2009, the unemployment rate was already above 
The Recovery Act, also known as the stimulus, is what people usually point to when pressed to explain why they think President Obama has increased spending. But the truth is that more than a third of the Recovery Act was tax cuts. The stimulus cut taxes for 95% of American families. Another third was fiscal aid to the states, which were feeling the same budget crunch as the federal government, but in most cases didn't have the option of running a deficit in, in tough years. Without the Recovery Act, imagine how many more teachers and firefighters and police officers would have had to been laid off. And imagine what that would have meant to our economy, never mind what it would have meant to our communities. But the third that gets the most attention was the third that went toward creating jobs. Now, now did it work? Well, there are a few ways to answer that question, but the answer is the same every time, yes. First, we could look at our chart. You can see that once the Recovery Act began to get it, be implemented, that we started losing less jobs, and then we started creating jobs. We've had 30 months, 30 straight months of job private, in the private sector of, of job growth. Now, second, you could ask economists. Most reputable economists, including... Would my, would my friend yield? Uh, certainly. Majority Leader. Mr. President, Madam President, I'm so sorry. I have no more votes today. No more votes today. It's obvious to me what's going on. I've, I've been to a few of these rodeos. It's obvious there's a big stall taking place, so one of the senators who doesn't want to be in the debate tonight won't be in the debate. Well, he can't use the senator's excuse. There will be no more votes today. Senator from Minnesota. Thank you. That is, that is too bad. I, I was going over really what happened, reviewing what happened once the stimulus package had been passed in February when unemployment was over 8 percent. And you can see that as it started taking effect that we lost less and less jobs and then since have had 30 straight months of private sector job growth. And I said we could ask economists, the most reputable economists, including those at the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, agreed the Recovery Act creators saved anywhere from 2.5 million to 3.5 million jobs. And in the words of Mark Zandi, Senator John McCain's own economic advisor in the 2008 presidential campaign, the federal policy response to the financial crisis, including the stimulus, quote, probably averted what could have been called depression, the Great Depression 2.0. But we don't have to take Mark Zandi's words for it. We don't have to take the words of all the other reputable economists. We don't even have to take the Congressional Budget Office's words, word for it, although we here in Congress and CBO sort of exists for us to take their word for it. But we can just ask Jamie, Cecile, and Sheila. This, this is Jamie working on the Duluth lift bridge a couple of years back. Uh, this coming right here is Cecil. Uh, he's working on a highway extension project. Here, let's give Cecil his due. Uh, Cecil is working on a uh, highway extension project in Brooklyn Park in suburban Twin Cities. Then we have Sheila. This is her in front of her bobcat working the night shift on 
and I-94 improvement project. These are people these are people who are put back to work by the stimulus. And despite claims by some that the only jobs created by the stimulus went to government bureaucrats, you will notice that Jamie, Cecil, and Sheila are not, in fact, government bureaucrats. Thankfully, we do not let government bureaucrats operate heavy machinery. So what can we say about President Obama's approach so far? Well, he slowed the growth of federal spending to its lowest level since Eisenhower. He's cut taxes, not just in the stimulus package, but many times during his first term to the tune of more than $850 billion. And when the economy was at its low point, he made investments that put people back to work in the short term and prevented things from getting even worse. Now, there was another road that we could have taken. That of approach would have involved not just cutting spending, but gutting the government. And it definitely wouldn't have involved making investments to put people back to work. We'll never know whether that approach, known as austerity, would have gotten us results like the one reflected in on the previous chart, but we do know what happened in countries where they tried this alternate approach. This is European countries that went the austerity route. This is GDP from 2008 to 2012. This would be where President Obama became president. And Europe, and we all were seeing a global meltdown. This is countries that did austerity in Europe. This is the United States. The evidence tells us that our way worked. Oh, President Obama's way worked, and, and theirs did not. Of course, while we're better off than we were four years ago, and better off than we would be if we had tried austerity instead of President Obama's approach, which, if you look at the growth of spending, was pretty close to austerity, but we're obviously still not where we want to be, either in terms of our economy or in terms of our deficit. So what's the right way going forward? First, let's talk about deficit reduction. It's clear to me that any solution that does not include both increased revenue and decreased spending simply isn't going to work. The hole's too big for us to tax our way out or to cut our way out. We have to do both. But the hole is, in fact, so big that we can't even just get out of it just by taxing and cutting. We have to grow our way out, too. That's why I think we need to invest in education and in infrastructure and in innovation. That means early childhood education, which has a return of investment in every study, quality early childhood education of $16 for every dollar spent, and in workforce training, and in roads and bridges, and rural broadband, and clean energy, and healthcare technology. I don't think that only the government can create jobs, I know that. But I know that only the government can make those critical investments that will help the private sector create jobs. And I know it works when we do. It worked after World War II. It worked under President Clinton. It worked in the Recovery Act. Those investments, however, cost money, and we won't be able to afford them unless we reduce our deficits. I think people who talk about cutting spending should say, what spending they want to cut. I want to cut spending, so let me 
tell you what spending I want to cut. I want to cut the billions in subsidies that we give to oil companies that simply don't need them. I want to let Medicare negotiate for pharmaceuticals under Part D, just like the VA does, because prohibiting Medicare from doing so amounts to a subsidy for pharmaceutical companies, one that, again, they don't need. And I want to make cuts in our military budget because as the Comprehensive Defense Review, begun under Defense Secretary Gates and completed under Secretary Panetta, found we can make hundreds of billions of dollars in cuts to the defense budget without compromising our fundamental security and military interests. Of course, we can't only cut the things we think are easy calls to cut. We're going to have to cut some things that we don't want to cut. And speaking personally, I've already had to vote for some of those hard cuts, and it was not fun. But there simply aren't enough cuts to make. So it's clear to me that if we are going to protect our most vulnerable Americans, our children, the sick, the disabled, our seniors, and make the investments that will grow our middle class and our economy, we are going to have to raise revenue. And like President Reagan, but unlike some of today's Republicans, I know that you don't raise revenue by cutting taxes. That's why I support restoring the Bush tax cuts for the first $250,000 of income, but after that, allowing the top marginal rate to go back to where it was under President Clinton. I know that just like they did in 1993, people will argue that doing so will hurt the economy, but I'm equally confident that just like they were in 1993, they will be wrong. I know that we all come to the debate about our nation's challenges with different philosophies and different convictions, and I respect that many of my colleagues feel they'd be betraying their own political core by asking the wealthy to pay a little more or investing taxpayer dollars in job creation. I didn't feel great about all the cuts I've had to vote for over the last couple of years either. But I don't think we're going to get anywhere if we're so invested in following our own ideologies that we refuse to acknowledge the lessons of where we have been or the truth about where we are and where we are headed. We're not going to get anywhere if we can't agree that, yes, the government does have a role to play in helping the private sector create jobs. And no, you won't cut the deficit by cutting taxes. And yes, we're going to have to raise both revenues, raise revenues and reduce spending if we want to get a balanced budget. And no, asking the wealthy to pay a little more won't drive us back into a recession. We've debated these issues a lot this year and we haven't resolved the argument now we're going home, and it's the American people's time. It's the American people who get to have their say. So I hope that over the next six weeks, we lead them in a debate worthy of the challenges that we face, a debate rooted in the facts and mindful of our history. And I hope that when we come back, we're ready to have that kind of worthy debate ourselves and then make the tough calls just as our constituents will in November. I wish my colleagues well over the recess. 
and I look forward to getting back to our important work when we return. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. The Republican leader. Madam President, I see my friend, the Majority Leader, here on the floor. I was a little surprised that he announced no more votes uh, a little while ago. Um, I'm <clears throat> we're prepared to finish a business today. Uh, in fact, I intend to offer shortly the unanimous consent agreement that the Majority Leader himself was shopping last night. Um, our side of the aisle is prepared to, uh, uh, to finish up. Uh, the business for this uh, particular uh, pre-election session. So with that in mind, I ask unanimous consent that at 5 p.m. today, the Senate proceed to the consideration of S-3576, Senator Paul's bill regarding foreign aid, that there be up to two hours of debate equally divided between Senators Paul and Kerry or their designees, that upon the use or yielding back of that time, the Senate proceed to vote on passage of the bill. That the vote on passage be subject to a 60 vote affirmative threshold. That if the bill does not achieve 60 affirmative votes, it be considered as having been read twice, placed on the calendar. That following the vote on passage of that legislation, S3576, the Senate proceed to consideration of calendar number 418, SJ Res 41 that there be up to 60 minutes of debate equally divided between Senators Graham and Senator Paul or their designees, that upon the use or yielding back of that time, the Senate proceed to vote on passage of the joint resolution, that if the joint resolution is not passed, it be returned to the calendar, that following the vote on the joint resolution, the Senate resume consideration of H.J. Res 117, the continuing resolution, that the motion to proceed be agreed to, there be up to 30 minutes of debate equally divided between the two leaders or their designees, with Senator Coburn controlling 15 minutes of the Republican time prior to a vote on passage of the joint resolution, that the vote on passage be subject to a 60-vote affirmative threshold, that following the vote, the majority leader be recognized, and finally, that no amendments, motions, or points of order be in order during the consideration of these measures. Madam President. The Majority Leader. I'm reserving the right to object. <clears throat> Mr. President, we've had the stall here for several days now. And um, I want to make sure that uh, one of the senators who wanted to go to a debate would be able to do that tonight. So he can go now. As I announced a half hour ago, plenty of time to get do the debate. Um, now, Madam President, as I've indicated before, we're anxious to finish the business that we have to do this work period. I'm happy to vote on the Paul Amendment. I've said that. I'm the one that arranged it, so it's possible to vote on that. I have no regret as to having done that. I'm happy to vote on the containment resolution, something that has 80 or more sponsors. I'm happy to, to uh, have all these votes. The vote on the, in fact, we can do the debate tonight on the uh, containment resolution and the Paul Amendment. But Madam President, understand this. We are not separating uh, the vote on the CR and a piece of legislation that groups around this country have been trying to get done for years, been held up here. As I've said before, everything shouldn't be a fight here. The Senator from Montana, Senator Tester, has assembled a broad package of bipartisan legislation that has, I repeat, wide-ranging support from Republicans. There's, they're noted publicly in publications here saying they support it. They'll vote for it. It has the support of sportsmen throughout this country. Getting to vote on this bill should not have to be a big fight. This sort of thing that we ought to be able to simply vote on, and we're going to do that. But we're not going to, to uh, separate the two. We're going to have a vote on the CR, and immediately thereafter, we'll have a vote on the motion to proceed to the Sportsman's Bill. Now, we can have all this stuff. We can do get the debate out of the way tonight. We can vote tomorrow. If not, we're going to vote tomorrow after midnight, and that will take care of one vote. And the next one will be sometime Sunday morning. 
And so we'll, we'll have a, if, unless we can work something out, uh, where we, we're not having these votes today. So everyone should understand I am, I am, we're not going to do that for the reasons I've already indicated. And so we want to do this stuff. We can do it early in the morning. That's fine with me. Or we can wait till tomorrow night after midnight and then come here Sunday morning. So I object. Objection is heard. <clears throat> Madam President, just, just so everybody in the Senate will under, understand, both Democrats and Republicans, I just offered the consent the Majority Leader himself was trying to get last night. Senate Republicans are prepared to finish the continuing resolution today, prepared to vote on the, the, the Rand Paul proposal today, prepared to vote on the Lindsey Graham proposal today. That was acceptable to the Majority Leader. It's not acceptable to him today. So obviously some, something changed over on that side of the aisle. So I just want everybody to understand that I'm, I'm prepared and all the members of my conference are prepared to finish up the business of the Senate that was before the Senate at the suggestion of the majority leader as recently as last night. While we're educating senators, I would like to add a little to that. We're willing to vote on all these things. We'll do it tomorrow, not today. We don't want that. We want the debate to go play, to go forward, and win a very important Senate race around the country. So we can do it early in the morning, get all the debate out of the way, or do it uh, tomorrow night after midnight. Yeah, because we're we're not going to separate the sportsmen from the rest of the stuff, for obvious reasons. Well, I would only add that that's a new development. Uh, I hear what the majority leader is saying, um, and I yield the floor. M Madam President, there has majority. been no new development. Everyone, everyone, Republican staff, Democratic staff, all my caucus, we've known for a long time that we're going to have a vote on this sportsman package. This is no new development. Note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Leader. We do have, but I ask consent to call the quorum be terminated. Without objection. We have a very important uh, matter at 4 o'clock today. The Secretary of State is coming here to uh, address all of us as to what's going on in the Middle East and around the world. There will be intelligence officers there and a lot of other people. So I ask unanimous consent, the Senate recess from 4 to 5 today to accommodate this very important Senator's only briefing. With, is there an objection? Uh, M Madam, Madam President, it's my understanding that we have a couple of senators who would like to speak before that. Senator Collins, how much time does she need? Oh. We, I, have no, I have no problem with the senator from Texas speaking. I need 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, that's fine. And how about Senator Collins? She wishes to speak? Okay, I ask consent then that, that Senator Cornyn be recognized for up to 15 minutes. When he completes that, the Senate go into recess for one hour. Without objection. Senator from Texas. I thank the, uh, the majority leader for his courtesy. Earlier this month, we received another big job report, and along with it, a serious disappointment. The numbers speak for themselves. In August, a remarkable 368,000 Americans left the workforce. They gave up bringing the labor force participation rate, as it's known, to its lowest level in more than three decades. Fewer people are looking for work in America than at any time in the last 30 years. That is a national tragedy. The unemployment rate stayed above 8 percent only because they quit counting the people who've given up. But it had been above 8 percent for the 43rd straight month. If, in fact, the same number of people that were looking for work in January of 2009 were still looking for work in today, the unemployment rate would be over 11 percent. That was the date that President Obama took office, January the 20th, 2009. 
So if the same number we're looking today as we're looking for work then, it would be over 11 percent to show you how those numbers don't reveal the true pain and the sacrifice of American citizens who are looking for work. I don't know anyone who could look at the August job report or the July job numbers or the June job numbers and feel good about the economy. I also don't know how they could, contrary to their position, including the President's position, in December 2010, when the economy was growing at roughly 3 percent of GDP, why they could now support a tax increase when the economy is growing at a much slower pace. Beyond our borders, the Europeans are mired in a debt crisis. The Chinese economy has slowed down dramatically, and the United States continues to face major economic headwinds. We can't afford any self-inflicted wounds. All I'm suggesting is that we maintain the current federal tax rates until we can work together in a bipartisan way and adopt real tax reform. And yet the President occasionally is, calls that position extreme. Ironically, the same position he himself held in December of 2010, as I said just a moment ago. <clears throat> it seems that the President does not always understand or appreciate the strong connection between taxes and economic incentives on small businesses and other people we're depending upon to create businesses or to grow existing businesses and create jobs and to put Americans back to work. We need look no further than the 2010 health care law, the law that went to the United States Supreme Court. Two aspects of it were found unconstitutional but not the tax on middle-class Americans. In addition to that middle-class in tax increase, the law contains a new excise tax on medical device manufacturers that will discourage companies from building factories and creating jobs here in the United States. That's not just my conclusion. For example, Cook Medical, which has roughly 4,000 employees, around Bloomington, Indiana, recently announced it as canceling five new manufacturing plants that had been scheduled to open over the next half decade. A senior official estimated that the new medical device tax will cost his firm between $20 million and $30 million extra each year. That's why they're shut shuttering those additional five plants and killing those potential new jobs. Another medical device company in another part of the country, in New York, Welch Allen, recently announced that it would be slashing 10 percent of its global workforce in response to this new tax. All of this is sadly predictable, and it is common sense. Unfortunately, common sense doesn't seem to most Americans to prevail or to be all that common here in Washington, D.C. these days. But if you raise the taxes on these medical devices, it's only logical, it's only reasonable, it's only common sense to expect that these companies will produce fewer jobs and, in the process, less innovation. You know, the irony of this discussion over taxes is we now have a growing bipartisan consensus and Congress and in Washington, D.C., about the need for common sense tax reform that would broaden the base, lower the rates, and to help grow the economy by creating the proper incentives. That was a recommendation of the President's own bipartisan fiscal commission, the Simpson Bowles Commission, in, in December 2010. The President's own bipartisan fiscal commission where Republicans and Democrats agreed this is a good place to start in reforming our broken tax code, paying down the debt, and getting our country and our economy growing again. It was also the recommendation of the Domenici Rivlin panel, another bipartisan panel. 
both would have recommended or did recommend a more logical more equitable more growth oriented tax code why we may ask is tax reform so urgent well earlier this month the world economic forum released its new global competitiveness report america is not alone in trying to create jobs and grow our economy we're competing with other economies other countries around the world as recent as 2008 the United States was ranked the most competitive country on the planet. In the latest index, we fell to seventh. We are heading in the wrong direction when it comes to competing in a global economy for the jobs so that Americans can work and provide for their families and put food on their tables and gain the dignity that goes along with working and providing for your family. Harvard Business School also uh, recently surveyed 10,000 of its alumni to find out their views of American competitiveness. Harvard Business School, one of the premier business schools in the country. Alarmingly, 71% of those respond, who responded said America would become less competitive during the next few years. In other words, they weren't optimistic about the direction of the country when it came to competitiveness and job creation. One of the biggest reasons for their pessimism was the bewildering complexity of our tax code. A large majority of the Harvard respondents said the tax complexity was either much worse or somewhat worse in the United States than it was in other developed countries. That's why Americans now spend billions of dollars on tax compliance because of a broken, unnecessarily complex, an impenetrable tax code unless you have the money to hire armies of lawyers and accountants to help you figure it out. One more point about our tax code. Over time, our tax code has become larded with special provisions and tax expenditures that uh, represent really what has come to be known as crony capitalism. In other words, the federal government just doesn't spend money. The federal government has a tax code that benefits, benefits certain industries and sectors of the economy. Now, some of them we would largely agree on, like the uh, mortgage interest uh, deduction for the interest you pay on your home mortgage. There's broad support for that, although everyone realizes we need to get all of these on the table, and that's what Simpson Bowles recommended. Let's get a trillion dollars or more of these special tax expenditures on the table and look at the ones that still make sense and the ones we should do away with. As long as the tax code is as complicated as ours is, it's a drag on the economy. It promotes a culture of corruption where people come to Congress and they lobby for special tax provisions that aren't available to the broad population that benefit them. It seeks favoritism and rent-seeking with companies and industries try to gain competitive advantages through tax subsidies. If we want businesses to spend more time in productive activity and less time begging the government for tax breaks, we need to fix the broken tax code with a flatter, fairer, more transparent system which encourages working and saving and investing, not lobbying here in Washington, D.C. for special breaks. If we want our tax laws to be respected and understood, they need to be clearer, simpler, and more equitable. Given how much President Obama talks about fairness of the tax code, you'd think he would be all over this. You might expect he would be an eager champion for tax reform. Instead, the president wants to use the tax code as an ATM machine to subsidize particular industries and interest groups while punishing others. We need to get them all on the table, bring them all out in the light of day, and address all of these special tax provisions so we can simplify and make more fair our tax system, unleashing the growth potential of the, of the entrepreneurial American economy to create jobs and prosperity 
that is sadly lacking now in the current environment. Unfortunately, President Obama has, rather than attack this issue of crony capitalism, he's promoted it. During the long government-run Chrysler bankruptcy process, the company's secured bondholders received less for their loans, 29 cents per dollar, than the United Auto Workers pension funds. They got 40 cents on the dollar. The UAW pension funds, mind you, were unsecured creditors, entitled to less of a priority than the bondholders, which were entitled to the highest priority. But because of the way this was manipulated, the bondholders got 29 cents on the dollar, the union got 40 cents on the dollar. During the automobile bailouts, President Obama let politics trump the rule of law. What do I mean by that? Well, I believe that rather than let the rule of law apply, he injected politics and favoritism in the process. In his energy policy, which I alluded to a moment ago, he put politics before his fiduciary responsibility to the American taxpayer. We agree that the federal government has a role in funding through the research and development tax credit and other ways, basic scientific research to promote innovation. But the President and Congress should not be using your tax dollars to make risky, politically motivated investments that benefit specific companies or industries at your expense. Solyndra offers the most conspicuous example. This now bankrupt solar energy firm received a $535 million loan guarantee from the federal government. According to the Washington Post, the Obama administration remained steadfast in its support for Solyndra even after being warned that financial disaster might lie ahead. Then as Solyndra went bankrupt, the administration violated the law by making taxpayers subordinate to private lenders. In other words, even though the taxpayers gave a $535 million loan guarantee to this company that went bankrupt, the ones that ended up taking it in the neck were the taxpayers rather than the private lenders who should have been subordinated to the taxpayers when it come to, came, comes to getting paid. If President Obama is con as concerned as he claims about dicey investments with taxpayer money, he should repudiate these kind of boondoggles and let the market work to allocate capital. Washington should not be picking economic winners and losers. Speaking of winners and losers, the Department of Health and Human Services granted a series of one- and three-year waivers from the annual limit requirements contained in the President's 2010 health care law. These waivers fostered the impression that certain companies, unions, and institutions would be exempted and be given preferential treatment. Mr. President, I know that uh, there is an important briefing going on in uh, secured facilities downstairs on the situation in the Mideast. What I would like to do is to make the remainder of my remarks uh, part of the record at this time. Without objection. I appreciate it, Mr. President. And with that, I would uh, yield the floor.